Hey, I'm RJ. I've sat on both sides of the interview table in a ton of interviews, and while system design is such a huge field, there's three topics that come up in almost every interview. Let's start with caching. Caching comes up so often because every system has hot data or data that gets accessed repeatedly. Interviewers want to see if you can speed up access to that data without crushing your database. At its core, caching just means storing data closer to the user or the application so you don't have to keep going back to a slower system or database to get data every single time. This could be in memory, on disk, in the browser, or even out at a CDN edge. The goal is always the same, faster access. Imagine we're building a system like Twitter. If every time somebody loaded their feed, we had to hit the underlying database, this would absolutely crush the system. Instead, we can cache the feed in memory. Now users can get it instantly. But caching isn't just one thing. We might cache in the application layer with something like Redis or Memcache. We could also cache on the client side in the user's browser so the same data doesn't have to reload over and over again or we could cache at the CDN edge. This is what makes platforms like YouTube or Netflix so fast worldwide. Now, while all that might sound amazing, caching is not without its problems. Now we introduce a problem called cache invalidation. What happens when the data in our cache goes stale and how do we make sure we're not serving outdated information? To deal with this, here are a few common strategies for controlling what's in the cache. First, write through caching. Every single write will go to both the database and the cache at the same time. This will keep things between the database and the cache consistent, but also makes writes a little bit slower. Next, we have write around caching. Writes go straight to the database and the cache is only updated when the data is read again later. This avoids filling the cache with new data that might never be read, but it does mean that the first time somebody reads that data, it is slower because we have to repopulate the cache with the data. And finally, we have write behind caching. Writes go to the cache first and then are asynchronously pushed to the database. This gives you super fast writes because we're only writing to the cache in memory, but if the cache somehow fails before syncing, you risk losing data. Caching can speed things up and make designs way more efficient, but it's not without its trade-offs. If you wanna see a video where I talk a little bit more about the downsides of caching in real systems, I'll link it in the description for your next watch. Let's move on to the second pattern, load balancing. Load balancing comes up because one bottleneck almost every company faces when they go to scale up their service is one server is not enough. If that server crashes, customers lose access to their product. If they need to support more users, well, the hardware for one server is only so powerful. Imagine we're running an e-commerce site during Black Friday. We have millions of people all hitting the checkout button at the same time. If we have one server handling all those requests, it would crash instantly, no matter how big your virtual machine is. With a load balancer in front, those requests can be distributed across many servers, and suddenly we can scale horizontally. Now, there are a few common ways to actually handle the load balancing here, the first of which is round robin. Requests are just sent one after another to each server in turn. Simple, but this doesn't account for uneven workloads. Next, we have least connections. Traffic goes to the server handling the fewest active requests. This is more adaptive, but now we have to track how many requests each server is handling. And finally, hash base. The request gets routed based on a key, like a user ID or a shopping cart ID. This is great for keeping related traffic together, but it can create hotspots if keys aren't well distributed. Load balancers can also live at different layers. Layer four load balancers look at things like network information, like the IP and port. Layer seven load balancers can go a lot deeper, and then we can route based on things like HTTP headers and URLs. Layer seven gives you more control, but it also adds additional overhead. Load balancing is one of those patterns that you just have to know. I've never been in a design interview where it didn't come up. Let's dive into the third pattern, database sharding. This pretty much always comes up because at some point your database just gets too big. Database sharding basically means splitting your data across multiple databases so no single machine has to store or handle all of the load. Each shard is responsible for just a portion of the data. Imagine we've been asked to design a healthcare system that manages digital medical records. Hospitals across the country are all writing patient data at the same time. Visits, prescriptions, lab results. If we try to store everything in one database, performance will quickly suffer. Instead, you might shard by patient ID. So each shard only holds a slice of the total patients and their records. This way, queries stay fast, even as the system scales to millions of patients. There are a few common ways to shard, the first of which is called range-based sharding. We can split up the data by ranges of patient IDs. For example, shard one could store IDs one through one million, shard two, one million through two million, and so on. It's simple, but it can cause hotspots if most of the activity clusters in one range. Next, hash-based sharding. We can apply a hash to the patient ID and then route that record to a shard. With something like consistent hashing, we can perfectly balance the load here, but range queries or queries that might have to go across related data might now have to spend multiple partitions, which is a really bad access pattern. One other strategy that can work really well is geo sharding. We split up the data by region. In this example, patients on the East Coast could be in one shard and the West Coast on another shard. This will work really well when queries are always scoped to a single region, but if data needs to be shared across regions, this can quickly become a problem. Sharding is super powerful, but it also introduced some risks. Whenever you're in an interview, 
make sure you think about how to minimize cross shard queries, what you'll do if you have to reshard because one shard grows too large, and how you'll avoid hotkeys from overloading a single shard. Sharding is pretty much always going to show up in interviews where you're designing for millions or billions of users, but it's not without its trade offs. If you found this helpful, feel free to subscribe. I'll be simply breaking down more system design concepts throughout the next coming weeks. See you next time.